course you can call me daddy. And if you want to follow me on Facebook, you can find me at james.desbra, Post Muslim Studios, all one word, JD Writer and JGD Games. Hello lovelies, from my plus five wearable blanket of coziness, because it's gold. I've got a shit ton of stuff to review, uh, so I'd better start cracking on it. And amongst the stuff that I have to review is the Wretched series by uh, Miguel and Sylvia of The Red Room, who worked for me in the past, so keep that in mind, or at least uh, I sold stuff that they created in the past, um, and I got the, sent these for free. Ethics are important in games journalism, believe it or not, and uh, I still believe that. So, there's a bunch to look at here but this won't take as long as it might otherwise appear uh, because it's all based around the same kind of core system. So let's start with Rexploitation. If you're just looking to pick up the system, this is probably one of the better ones to get. It's an OSR system, so it's all the same kind of familiar statistics that you might be used to from D&D &D and all its derivatives. Uh, but the Wretched system has a few little tweaks and twists and turns um, that, that, that make it somewhat individual. We'll cover that first. So, you start with the character concept. You choose a sin that um, embodies them. This basically encourages you to play a character that is somewhat darkly unheroic in some ways, and whenever you indulge that sinful weakness, you get bonuses. Bonuses to experience points and bonuses to a role. Personally, I don't think that the bonus you get is enough. Um, enough to encourage people to indulge these sins. So I would uh, crank that up a bit, though, depending on genre and so on, because a small amount of extra experience points, and uh, I think it's a re-roll, if I remember correctly. Um, let's see. Yeah, extra 10% XP and one free dice re-roll used next session. That, that doesn't seem a strong enough incentive to me for people to cock up. Um, but this is a way of encouraging people to play out their flaws um, that I've often encouraged, and which I think is particularly well done in the older editions of Deadlands. I haven't looked at the newer edition of Deadlands, so, so I couldn't tell you. But anything that encourages players to play up their flaws and takes that you know those calculation cycles away from the from the GM's efforts. Yeah, that that's a good thing, and providing a bonus for it is is also a good way to encourage them to do it. But I just I just don't think ten percent XP and one reroll is is enough, especially since you have to wait to the next session for the reroll. So I would say if you play up your sin, you gain a reroll, and you can bank those rerolls, uh, maybe a number of times equal equal to your level. Something like that. That would certainly encourage more kind of um, pulpy and exploitation style behaviour with, with reference to this book in particular, but, but also in other games. I think that would encourage people to play it up more. You never have to encourage players to remember their perks and bonuses. They'll handle that for themselves. But yeah, that, that's one interesting departure. I just don't think it's strong enough. Um, so abilities are the kind of standard thing that you might expect. Their effect on the game is pretty much as you'd expect. Classes vary from genre to genre. Um, they're a lot more general, somewhere between a class and a background uh, in newer d and I would say. Um, they're not hugely impactful and they're quite broad, so that leaves you fairly free to customise your character. As, as you prefer. Um, there's genre specific examples in, in each game. Like this is meant to be exploitation style. So assassin, ninja, 
average citizen, you know, serial killer, private eye, conjurer, the kind of things that you might expect from those sorts of things. Um, but they're, they're not hugely impactful. So you can choose it, you know, broadly the right thing and then you can get into it. Um, you do have hit points, not necessarily a huge amount of hit points that is modified by your uh, by your class. You get skills, which is where the real customization comes in. So you can think of it more like a a kind of third edition D and D in terms of character customization, uh, in terms of skills, uh, but more like OSR in terms of the basic setup and the kind of power level that you're that you're thinking about. Um, as well as your sins, you can get perks and drawbacks. Um, unfortunately, you have to remember the drawbacks. Maybe that could be worked into and with the sin system in some way to encourage people to remember and to apply their own drawbacks. Again, you don't have to worry about them remembering their perks, but you'll find genre-specific forms of these in, in most of the other books. Um, we have vehicle rules, which are important in more modern science fiction games. You know, they're, they're serviceable, they, they work, but run into the same problem that you generally always have uh, with D&D-derived games in that all you can really do is make things into um, a hit point soak. Mm. Difficulty levels and so on will be familiar from more modern editions of D&D. There'll be specific skills in some cases for particular games and genres. Um, I mean, <coughs> there's not a tremendous amount to, to say there. So the system is basically a, an adaptable toolkit with touchstones in the OSR and other familiar types of games with enough things that are different to make it much more of a, of a skill-based system, a much more customizable set of characters than you might necessarily expect. Um, if you're more used to sort of standard OSR type stuff, so it's a it's a solid skeleton of a of a more modern rule set, I would say, um, for use in pickup games, uh, more modern science fiction, near future or historical type games where magic and psionics have less of an impact. Though you will find them in this there. Normally, you're not really going to be hurling massive fireballs at people. Put it put it that way. So you'll find a quite limited kind of kind of spell list representing the more sort of um, low magic or or no magic world in which some small psychic talents and magic might might appear. So of the books, this one is much more of a toolkit. But I don't think this one really hits its mark in terms of, of genre. When you say exploitation, to me, I tend to think more of like 70s cinema, um, that that kind of thing. You know, black exploitation and the, the various other, other genres of exploitation. The artwork and so on tends to be much more derived from the kind of 40s and 50s fetish and pulps stuff so it doesn't necessarily reflect the exploitation genre um, correctly I, I necessarily think you can still use the system but atmospherically what you see on the cover it's not really necessarily what you see inside. Now there may be some kind of bleed over between the various uh, genres of, of exploitation and pulp uh, in, in Portugal that you don't get in the in the UK or the US. I don't know. It could be a cultural difference. Uh, Miguel and Sylvia are from Portugal, so I think this this book suffers somewhat from that. But if you're looking for um, a, a quick and easy system that D&D type players are going to be reasonably familiar with to do a short campaign or a one shot or something historically, 
um, or within the exploitation pulp uh, giallo sort of sort of genre, then I, you could probably do worse than this. Um, I will have more to say on that at, at the end. But the historical artwork, while copyright free uh, and available, doesn't necessarily work if you're going for exploitation here. So I, I think that's a, that's a problem with that book. Wretched Apocalypse takes that same system and transfers it to a post-apocalyptic world. Um, it's very, this one's much more atmospheric. Um, the print quality is different, I think. Um, I use the lower quality Lulu print color for a lot of stuff because I'm going for that kind of um, pulpy sort of sort of look and feel to it. And that works for the exploitation. This feels like a better quality print. I don't know whether it is or not. Maybe something's changed in the machines or whoever printed it, but the print quality is a bit better. You'll find the same familiar sort of transgressions idea. Um, you'll find the same sort of abilities that you might be familiar with. Uh, same sort of skills as you'll see in, in exploitation, largely you know, post-apocalyptic genre. Still fairly modern. Uh, you might find mutants and, and psychic powers and things, depending on the kind of apocalypse that we're talking about. But yeah, that's, that's all covered. You'll find a few new and different classes, like the cyborg. But again, that will depend on what kind of apocalypse you're really going for. Um, there's lots of atmospheric tables and so on. There's not really a world any more than there is in Rexploitation. This is still much more of a sort of toolkit, I think. Um, you'll have all the usual kind of OSR mechanics. You have your perks and drawbacks. There is a few different ones here and there in this. Um, yeah, it's all it's all pretty familiar, especially if you know one of the other wretched books you know that's the advantage of osr type mechanics most people uh <laughs> D, D is the lingua franca of of role-playing games uh if someone understands D, &D they can understand something or even a lot of things about other games so yeah this is just really a, a another thematic rule set without any real specific world set out in it so again it's it's another toolkit for doing something post apocalypse -y. um i don't think there's anything particularly different i think there might be some more and different psychic powers compared to exploitation um and lots lots of flavorful tables though you'll find if you play a lot uh i think the the results will get somewhat somewhat repetitive um, while there's no particular set setting there is more flavor to this and uh, more interesting rules and ideas for different factions that you can throw into your game lots of different creatures monsters uh, raiders and so on so yeah it, it's a good toolkit for that kind of thing certainly um, layout's fairly clear, it's a little too spaced out for, for my liking, like these tables. And there's a tendency to put bold flow into the text, rather than differentiating between the title and the content. Um, matter of personal taste, but I don't particularly like that. There is a, an elephant in the room here, and that is the use of AI art. And... Well, I've got more things to say about that, which I'll, which I'll save to the end, I suppose. But it's rapidly improving AI art as more people use it and it gets more training data and can tell what people find acceptable. It's kind of OK here, um, but there are instances where it screws up, like hands <laughs> in particular. Um, and it's not great at putting vehicles in the same perspective profile um, that the rest of the image is in. So it's a little bit jarring in this one in a way that it might not necessarily be in other contexts. 
But yeah, that's it, 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 it's another toolkit. Wretched Space should be another toolkit, but isn't particularly because it has rather set alien races and so on. Again, it makes quite heavy use of AI art, which works a little bit better here because things are supposed to be alien looking and um, hands have been avoided to some extent by focusing in on the faces. So it's um, the AI art isn't quite as jarring here. It works it works quite well. So you'll find alien races in here. Otherwise, the rules are largely again the same as you'll see in the other wretched universe things. Um, you've got your classes, which are familiar. A few different skills to reflect the science fiction nature of the game. Um, it's for playing kind of uh, pulpy space opera -y type type stuff with a more with an exploitative edge. So you could say space opera, you could say B movie sci fi, um, the kind of stuff that came out in the seventies and eighties. You know, just before and just after Star Wars, I would say that's the kind of kind of pitch that you've got there. Um, I mean, there's not a humongous amount to say about this. It is somewhat extended. The ve extended the vehicle and spaceship combat rules are a bit more fulsome than in the other books. Um, it's not a toolkit in the way, say, my machinations of the space princess is. There is more of a definitive background given the given the races and so on. Uh, sorry, species that have been created and so on. Um, it's more extended and expanded cybernetics, technology, uh, weapons rules, that sort of thing. Um, the AI art is atmospheric. I think there's a few non-AI pieces in here, here and there. And it's kind of um, fitting to use artificial intelligence on a science fiction book, I suppose, perhaps more than the post-apocalypse one. Um, it's it's bigger and thicker, I think, because it does have some kind of set background to it, and because of those extended rules. So you could turn it into a toolkit, but it is somewhat limited by being tied to a more specific background. Um, in a way that perhaps the, the previous couple of books weren't. But interesting, I, I would say. Richard Epoch, or Epoch, is steampunk, but with a Parisian, less technological, um, more Art Nouveau, sort of feel. It's kind of slightly more horror-y, slightly more detective-y. Um, Inspector Lupin, perhaps, would be a, a good touchstone for this. Um, it oozes setting implicitly uh, through much of what you'll much of what you'll find artistically in the book and the choices of font and so forth. There's good background information like cliff notes on the sources of inspiration, the forces at work at the time. Um, it seems to have been done again on the on the cheaper color print, but that really works for this, gives it a, a sepia tone throughout. And yeah, so steampunk or, or Victorian gaming has always tended to focus on London and England, which as, as, a, as a Britisher myself, I think is only right, but it is interesting to see um, a different spin. A real strength of Miguel's is his cultural literacy um, when it comes to genres and subgenres and and so forth. And that really shines through here as it did in his Giallo books. So you find a, a lot to a lot to uh, Sylvia presumably as well, um, but I, I, I don't I don't know her background quite quite as well. Uh, my my loss, I guess. 
but you'll find more classes, skills, everything appropriate to the to the genre and the and the time. It's setting is, is tweaked towards horror and investigations. You could almost view it as a sort of um, Parisian Call of Cthulhu without the Cthulhu entities necessarily. So you'll find more emphasis and focus on madness and magic and those kind of capabilities and weirdness and and monsters. Um, more depth on what conjurers can do than you'll necessarily have seen in the other books. Um, but all the magic and sonics are still fairly fairly low key. Yeah, again, it is an OSR derived system. Um, you'll find suitable monsters and creatures and animals and things nicely statted out all fine um, you'll find a good guide to the years that were involved and the, and the kind of time that we're talking about the Belle Epoque um, yeah I mean even if you're not going to use the system there is a good amount of extracted and presented information in this book for setting games of other kinds including Call of Cthulhu or whatever else um, in this time period and in this place so there, there's plenty here biographies plot hooks creatures oddities um, the criminal underworld of the city Paris um, how the police work yeah everything that you need to set something during that period, you know, in that era, in that place. And the good use of stock art, old art, and page colouring and so forth. Um, I think this is probably one of the better or best laid out works of the ones they sent me um, that there is to talk about. Um, there's, yeah, there's there's plenty, plenty here, including uh, using a tarot deck for encounters and so on, and maps of Paris and everything else. So... Of the ones that were sent me, I think Richard Epoch is possibly um, the best general source book for people who are interested in historical gaming, that sort of thing. You will find a lot of people in the OSR that are in, into that kind of thing, I think, but also beyond the OSR. So this should probably be marketed towards people who are into into other things beyond beyond that. So, yeah, that's that's my best pick out of these. And lastly, we have Wretched New Flesh, which is a sort of updated setting guide to Validad and the Wretched version of the rules. Now, they previously published postcards from Validad through me. It's nice to see some of the same design notes and fonts and things carried through. I quite like that. I always took this setting as being um, more more like over the edge so kind of understated slightly less cyberpunky and so on but they seem to have wound things on made it more technologically inclined more more science fiction uh, than mystery and oddness in this version the rules are the same kind of thing you'll see in the other wretched books with a few different archetypes slash classes a few different skills and abilities different emphasis and and broadness on the psionics and uh, the magic there's a lot of stock art in this uh, a bit less ai art but there is some ai art um and yeah, it just expands on and moves forward the setting. So that's that's the real draw here, I think. It's an entry point to the Avaladad setting. If you were disappointed in the most recent version of Over the Edge, which a lot of people, myself included, were, then this might tickle your pickle in a way that that one didn't. Um, and yeah, the system, again, it's it's a familiar system. So it's OSR derived, relatively easy to pick up and play with a, a relatively small amount of explaining 
and you can have people experience the setting through the game as you play which is um, a nice way to, to, to go about it I think that's probably the best way to experience the Avalidad setting is to be tourists or new immigrants come to the area to the zone and experiencing it for the first time because the world beyond Avalidad is a bit more like our normal real world uh, but not necessarily a hundred percent so that's probably the best way to get into it but yeah you'll find a bunch of stuff updated expanded if you enjoyed the Avalidad setting um, and its supplementary material before this kind of brings it all together updates it and provides a new system for experiencing it um, this is much more setting heavy than the other books and has some quite striking graphic design uh, through different aspects and, and pages it's, it's not a, not a huge amount more to say about it i mean that's that's what it is it is a weird science it's a it's a barosian philip k dick sort of setting where weird science interacts with relatively normal people and peculiar things can happen and um, you're likely to get your arm ripped off by a baboon when you take out the trash that's the kind of place that it is um, it's in many ways what over the edge should have been but uh, but wasn't so I mean the, yeah reviewing these is a, is a bit repetitive but that's because a lot of elements are the same so what you're gonna do Race exploitation is probably the weakest of the books thematically and so on but at relatively small size it's probably a, a decent one to pick up just for the system I would give this style three substance two it doesn't really give you a whole bunch are of, of useful information in the way that some of the other books do this is the weakest entry i would say uh, so that's five out of ten two and a half out of five um wretched apocalypse it's another toolkit game stylistically the ai art lets it down a bit sorry noisy interruption there um what was i saying uh the ai art really lets this one down because it's just not quite good enough um but you know it's it's cheap and when you're a small publisher that's a hard thing to beat but uh, again more about that at the end this is a toolkit so there's not a huge amount of specific information there's a lot of generic information um there's some implicit background which is the same kind of approach that i took with lamentations but still um style i mean some pieces are more atmospheric but i mean even on the cover you can see the distorted silhouette and where it comes to arms and weapons and vehicles it just it just really doesn't work so uh, style three substance three if you want a slightly more more fulsome uh, version of the wretched system go with that so that's six out of ten three out of five Wretched Space is much more complete. You could probably use Wretched Space to recreate Wretched Apocalypse um, or even more sort of Wretched Fantasy, I think. But there is much more of a background here, which is both limiting, but also one of the, the strengths in their writing. The AI art is much more fitting when it comes to, to this book, um, I think because kind of learned how to how to apply it and what not to get it to do and because alien silhouettes and chris foss style spaceships are much more forgiving of the weird oddities of ai art so uh style four substance four eight out of ten four out of five wretched epoch is my favorite of these books it is a great resource in the same way that the old GURPS source books used to be um, it's quite characterful 
I don't think the system is necessarily suited, but other than that, uh, a rather fantastic book. I would say uh, Style 5, Substance 4, 9 out of 10, 4.5 out of 5. Wretched New Flesh, uh, postcards from a Valadad. Wonderful update to the setting. Again, I don't know that the system is necessarily right. Um, better layout, subdued use of AI art, good use of slightly modified and altered um, and stylized stock art. Uh, style four, substance five, nine out of 10, four and a half out of five. Okay, the ethical elephant in the room is the AI art. Now, there's across the books, there is a mix of stock art, old art, and AI art. Um, yeah, this is the cheaper way to do it. It can be done well, it can be done badly. I think, in some cases, the AI art works like wretched space in others it doesn't like in wretched apocalypse a lot of people have a problem with small publishers using ai art i have used it to a limited extent in my own work what i basically do is i stretch the budget using it so i still spend what i used to on commissioning artists for specific pieces and then when i need filler of something that AI art can do well, that's when I use it. So I use a mix. Some artists, some consumers are dead set against AI art. Others use it as a basis. Uh, one of my favorite fantasy and science fiction artists, Jim Burns, has been, well, not exactly an advocate, but he has been adapting to the existence of AI art and using it as a, a base to get backgrounds and sort of rough configurations of what he wants to do and then modifying it and altering it in Photoshop. It's also a real skill to get what you want <laughs> out of an AI art generator. You have to be able to get and refine the prompts well. That's something I'm struggling with. That's, that's a genuine skill, I think, that is being underestimated. Like it or not, AI art is here to stay. Some people are going to use it a lot. Some people are going to use it a little. Some people are going to use it not at all. I'm trying to strike a sort of middle ground where I still spend what I used to on regular art from human beings because you can get exactly what you want then and filling out the space with AI art when necessary, when appropriate, when applicable. Um, when you are a small publisher, right, margins are razor thin. So any way that we can save money and get a published good looking book out there, you know, that enables people to publish. I would like to see them using more commissioned art as things move forward and move on. But I understand completely why a new startup would use so much AI art. It just doesn't work sometimes. Um, I've already done a video on some of the ethical concerns around AI, AI art. I might revisit it again and explain at greater length how and why I've used it um, and some of the issues that people are bringing up about it. But these guys use it a lot. Um, I don't know any other publishers offhand that are using it to the same extent that they are. The other... Uh, perhaps not elephant, but perhaps hippopotamus in the room is the use of OSR system. I believe that system matters, that when you are creating a game, it is best to use the right system for the job, because ideally setting and system should work together and produce an end result where you're more likely to have a successful game. So in a horror game, with high mortality, the system should reflect that. Um, in a heroic game, where things can go really well or really badly in an instant, and when characters should be highly resistant to, 
to damage and shouldn't just die on a whim. Obviously, you want a system to reflect that. I don't think, despite all the changes and improvements, that the Wretched OSR system is necessarily the right one for these settings. I think Interlock, Cyberpunk, that sort of thing would be better for postcards from a Validad. Um, though they did some interesting things with my actual fucking monsters system in the previous one that I also think worked well um, as a rules light system for reflecting that kind of thing. I don't think an OSR system works very well with this. Richard Epoch probably would have worked better using uh, an open BRP system or the open RuneQuest system, which is basically the same thing. Um, but it shines as a source book regardless of the OSR stuff. Um, again, I just don't think ever increasing massive amounts of hit points necessarily works in this kind of setting and, and idea. When it gets down to violence, this kind of investigative thing should be very, very dangerous indeed. And if you're higher level characters with a bunch of hit points, that doesn't tend to happen so much. Wretched Space... Um, I don't feel that I can complain <laughs> because of um, because of machinations of the Space Princess, which was an OSR system as well, and it was kind of an experiment. But so I don't feel that I can complain there, and there aren't a lot of great OSR science fiction systems. Maybe D six would work, but um, Traveller. Traveller's Derivative wouldn't, and uh, the same with a lot of others, so I can't really complain there. Uh, Wretched Apocalypse, Hit Point Bloat doesn't necessarily work very well with that uh, either. Again, perhaps Cyberpunk, Interlock, something like that would have worked as an open system for that. For that. And Wretchedploitation, while it's a good introduction to the Wretched system, for this kind of thing again um perhaps cyberpunk or fate even uh, would work better for that kind of kind of setting that said i understand why they would go for uh, an osr style system the market there is much more interested in the kind of thing culturally that they have to offer um the material and emphasis that they offer and that community is the one that they've very much more fallen in with, so are more likely to be supportive, less likely to complain. So, so I I understand. Uh, anyway, so that's a that's a block of books done. Again, bear in mind my relationship with the creators when reviewing what I've said here. Um, if you're an OSR head and you want to do sort of OSR modern. Uh, I suppose, then these are good options. And my main recommendation is still Wretched Epoch. Zhang. The Jalo Trilogy is a set of three scenarios by Miguel Ribeiro. These are scenarios in the style of the Italian pulps or the films of Dario Argento or Lucio Fulci. A blend of crime, psychosexual horror and the supernatural these are a perfect way to bring that odd, unsettling blend to your table. Presented as a generic roleplay heavy set of settings, these nonetheless have statistics for actual fucking monsters as a point of reference. Available at post-mort.com and drive-thru RPG.